Good day and welcome to Big Bad Tech. I'm your instructor, Jim Pytel. Today's topic of discussion is the flow control valve. Our objective today is to discuss the different configurations of a flow control valve and its purpose and function within a hydraulic system. First and foremost is a quick review about basic hydraulic circuits, where three outputs of a hydraulic system, speed, force, and direction, are controlled by three independent properties, flow, pressure, and valve position. Realize that I have been consistent with this definition throughout the course of this series, and I will continue to remain so. If you walk away with no other understanding of hydraulic systems besides the understanding that flow changes the speed of an actuator, pressure changes the applied force of an actuator, and valve position changes the direction of an actuator, I will consider my time having not been spent in vain. If, however, you are seeking a deeper knowledge about hydraulic systems and wish to go into finer details about these relationships, you will soon realize that there is not exactly an impenetrable brick wall between seemingly independent properties of pressure and flow. This being said, I need to emphasize an important point about our earlier discussion of the basic properties of hydraulic systems. At an actuator, all of these properties are always true and will always remain true. Realized components such as flow control valves above or below stream of an actuator will have an interplay between pressure and flow, but when it comes right down to the business end of a hydraulic system, the actuator, increased flow rate increases speed and increased pressure increases force, regardless of where it's coming from, regardless of any of the hoo-ha and hand-waving that precedes or follows it. When you're zooming in on a box and all you see is an input flow rate and input pressure to an actuator, you can rest easy knowing that the good guys wear white hats and the bad guys wear black. Outside of this box, however, is where things get a little fuzzy. Sometimes good guys wear gray hats, sometimes bad guys wear brown hats, and sometimes changes in pressure influence flow. As if that wasn't complicated enough, changes in pressure at different points within a system can influence flow rate. For example, changes in pressure above stream, like adjusting the pressure relief valve, can change flow, as well as changes below stream, like loading or unloading an actuator. This being said, if you're zooming in on a box with just an actuator in it, or zooming out on a very simple hydraulic system without a flow control valve in it, don't worry about it. Flow is speed, pressure is force, it's that simple. However, when you've got a device in there whose whole purpose is to restrict or control flow, things get a little more complicated. This device is a flow control valve. As the name implies, it controls flow. How it does this is by throttling the flow down from the maximum value a pump can produce. It's not like a flow control valve can ever supply additional flow beyond a pump's maximum, but can always reduce it from there. Flow control valves do this by providing a narrow constricted passageway called an orifice through which only a portion of this pump's maximum flow can negotiate in a certain amount of time. This is kind of like a crowd of juggalos building up outside of an insane clown posse concert while a narrow style of rent cops search every one of those dirty, dirty, paint-huffing subhumans for brass knuckles, coke razors, shanks, and zip guns prior to entrance. Sooner or later, some of those juggalos are just gonna get bored of waiting in line and drift off to shoplift energy drinks and smokes from the nearest convenience store or wander into the nearest street and cause a wreck. Returning to our hydraulic system, the flow that is not admitted through this tiny orifice backs up, and when flow backs up, what happens to pressure? It rises. When pressure rises to a certain point, the pressure relief valve is activated, and the excess portion is dumped through the pressure relief valve. Consider this kind of like the Kirchhoff's current law of hydraulics. If a fixed displacement pump is rotating at a constant speed, it is providing a constant flow rate. And if only a portion of this flow is being allowed into an actuator, where does the rest go? Obviously it has to go somewhere, and the only alternate path is through the relief valve. This is to imply the restriction type flow control valves always work in partnership with the pressure relief valve. Variable displacement pumps obviously don't have this issue, so much so that you may not even require a flow control valve at all if you can directly vary flow rate by changing the output of the pump. This is a pretty expensive option though if you can do the same with a simple fixed displacement pump and a flow control valve. A restriction type flow control valve may not necessarily be the most efficient means of controlling flow rate, however it's cheap and most importantly effective. 
schematic figures I've drawn on the left-hand side indicate the range of different types of flow control valves you may encounter. Schematically, these even show a restriction or narrowing of the passageway, giving you a hint how flow control valves do what they're supposed to do. These two at the top are fixed flow control valves, meaning the size of the orifice cannot be varied. These are sometimes called venturis and are sometimes drawn with straight lines indicating a fixed restriction. If a flow control valve is adjustable or variable, meaning the size of the orifice can be changed, the schematic indicates so with a variable arrow on the valve. We'll go into greater detail about how it varies the orifice size later, but for now, realize it does so by inserting or removing a portion of an adjustable needle into the path of oncoming fluid, hence the alternate name, needle valve. So if someone calls an adjustable flow control valve a needle valve, you can nod your head knowingly. Now realize you can adjust the flow of a system by partially opening or partially closing a shutoff valve, but is that what a shutoff valve is meant to do? No, it's supposed to shut off or turn on a system and it wasn't designed to meter flow to portions of a hydraulic circuit. Additionally, you can kink a hose or perhaps put too tight a turn in it and do the same thing. Ideally, your circuit doesn't have these errors in it, but realize these restrictions are acting like orifices and inadvertently affecting flow rate through your system and introducing inefficiencies. Moving on, our next flow control valve schematic is an adjustable flow control valve with check valve bypass. This check valve's purpose is to allow metered or controlled flow in one direction and allow free, unrestricted flow in the opposite direction. There are two reasons for this. One, it is a potentially desirable feature that will allow us to restrict the rate of travel for one direction of movement yet quickly move in the opposite direction. This is an important feature we will return to in a later lecture called flow control methods. Two, maybe flow control valves don't work as well in reverse. For example, your car goes in reverse, but very rarely would you back up all the way to work and back up all the way home. The flow control valve is the same it functions well in one direction and not so well in the other. When you need to, you can bypass the flow control valve completely through the check valve. By all means, pause the lecture and take a look at the schematic for the adjustable flow control valve with check valve bypass and figure out which direction is free flow and which direction is metered or controlled flow. The key to identifying these different modes is to examine the orientation of the check valve. This is an extremely important understanding for later discussions in the flow control methods lecture and would serve you well to get some practice now. For this flow control valve with check valve bypass, flow entering from left to right would force the check valve closed and all flow would be forced through the flow control valve. This is the direction of metered or controlled flow. If flow was to reverse direction, the check valve would be forced off its seat and allow free flow effectively bypassing the flow control valve. This is the direction of free or unrestricted flow. For our example hydraulic system, this flow control valve on the cap end of our cylinder will allow for controlled extension, yet when retracted, will do so very quickly. This is a meter in extension configuration because the flow control valve is controlling flow input to the cap end and limiting the rate of extension. Realize this may not be the best position for a flow control valve with a suspended weight or an overriding load. We'll return to discuss a different configuration in the flow control methods lecture called meter out extension that controls the flow rate leaving the rod end, which allows for the controlled descent of a lifted object. Finally, here are two additional types of flow control valves, namely the pressure compensated adjustable flow control valve with check valve bypass, and the temperature and pressure compensated adjustable flow control valve with check valve bypass. We'll discuss these two valves in a moment, but for now realize the compensation portion of their title means they will account for differences in upstream or downstream pressure and temperature to keep the flow rate constant despite these changes. Let's take a look inside an extremely simplified version of an adjustable flow control valve with check valve bypass. This is a non-pressure compensated flow control valve. We'll get to the internal workings of a pressure compensated flow control valve in a moment. The internal structure of a needle valve obviously features a needle. This one is manually adjustable via an external thumb wheel. 
The external thumb wheel may feature a colored scale on the knob to let you know if someone has been futzing with it in your absence. Additionally, it may feature a locking mechanism to prevent its readjustment. The check valve bypass at the bottom allows free unrestricted flow to pass in one direction, however forces metered flow in the opposite direction. Schematically, free flow is in this direction, and metered flow is opposite. In the cutaway view, free flow is in the same direction as the schematic free flow, and metered or controlled flow is also the same as the schematic. Do not for a moment assume any stickers or nameplates attached to any valves have any significance at all. The only way to reliably tell which direction is metered flow is to look at the schematic symbol oftentimes engraved on the side of an inline valve. A sticker or a nameplate could easily be installed upside down or obscured, but an engraving is less likely to be so. As flow is forced through the metered direction of our flow control valve, you'll notice a number of obstacles it must overcome. The position of the needle's tip in relation to its seat is one of the contributing factors which determine flow rate through this flow control valve. In addition to this needle, there are a series of 90 degree turns which fluid has to make as it passes through the valve. These turns and the needle in the path create a higher than normal restriction, turbulent flow, heat, and ultimately a pressure differential within the valve. This pressure differential is what determines flow rate. It must be restated that with no flow control valve in a system, pressure variations will ideally not affect flow. Pressure is force, flow is speed. Inside a flow control valve, however, is where pressure and flow interact. The greater the pressure differential, the greater the flow rate. This is mind-blowing stuff because the differential has two ends, upstream and downstream, and both can be individually or simultaneously adjusted up or down or kept the same to influence flow rate. Let's say this valve has a completely linear relationship between flow rate and pressure differential of one gallon per minute per 100 PSI of differential. Do not for a moment assume all flow control valves behave exactly like this, nor assume they are all perfectly linear, especially at the extremes of their operating range. This is a simplification only. However, assuming this flow control valve did behave in this fashion, if there was an input pressure of 500 PSI, and a load-induced pressure of 300 PSI, there would be a differential of 200 PSI. Given this valve's completely linear relationship between flow rate and pressure differential of one gallon per minute per 100 PSI of differential, this means we will have a flow rate of two gallons per minute. Let's say we increased input pressure to 800 PSI and kept our load-induced pressure of 300 PSI the same. This means there would be a 500 PSI differential and our flow rate would increase to five gallons per minute, provided the pump could produce this amount. Let's say we returned our input pressure to 500 PSI, however unloaded our actuator, so the load induced pressure was 100 PSI. This would mean there is a 400 PSI differential, and flow rate through this valve would be four gallons per minute. If we return to our initial conditions with a 500 PSI input and a 300 PSI load induced pressure output, there would be a 200 PSI differential for a flow rate of two gallons per minute. For a device that is supposed to be controlling flow, it doesn't seem to be doing a good job because these flow rates look all over the map. Or do they? First input pressure increased and flow went up. Then input pressure went down. However, the load decreased and flow went up from our initial state. However, when we return to the exact same input conditions we started with, our flow rate remained the same at two gallons per minute. This is the level of control a non-pressure compensated flow control valve provides. For a predictable input and output condition that is consistent and non-varying, flow rate will be consistent and non-varying. This bears repetition. A non-pressure compensated flow control valve provides constant flow for constant inputs given constant environmental conditions. This is a perfect application for a repetitive industrial process with a single actuator performing the same action on a single non-varying load inside a controlled environment. Given these conditions, a load will ideally move at constant speed. If our application required constant flow regardless of input conditions, one would need to step up to the pressure compensated flow control valve. In this case, this is an extremely simplified representation of 
of an adjustable pressure compensated flow control valve with a check valve bypass. Schematically, this vertical arrow on the flow control valve indicates that flow control is pressure compensated. In the simplified cutaway view, Notice we've installed a movable compensator spool, which adjusts the size of the orifice based on both the upstream and downstream inputs via these passageways. The upstream pressure moves the compensator spool via this passage. The downstream pressure moves the compensator spool via this passage. If the upstream pressure increases, it will close off the orifice and restrict flow. If the upstream pressure decreases, it will open up the orifice and increase flow. If the downstream pressure increases, it will open up the orifice and increase flow. If the downstream pressure decreases, it will close off the orifice and restrict flow. This movable internal compensation spool results in a constant flow rate output regardless of input conditions. Compare and contrast the difference in performance of our earlier adjustable non-pressure compensated flow control valve with check valve bypass with the adjustable pressure compensated flow control valve with check valve bypass with varying input and output pressures. Notice the pressure compensated flow control valve has a constant flow rate regardless of input conditions. Now when I say regardless of input conditions, realize pressure compensated flow control valves are not magic. And there's a certain ideal range inside which they can output constant flow rate. And at the limits of this range, this simplification breaks down. Now, to add an adjustable pressure compensated and temperature compensated flow control valve with check valve bypass to our arsenal, one would think I'd have to go through yet another painfully long discussion to do so. But you'll be happy to know it takes a very simple modification to this existing structure. Temperature, as we all know by now, affects viscosity, which affects flow rate. Imagine showing up at the hive on an unusually cold morning and being asked to pump honey. At midday, your honey pumper is pumping honey at a faster rate because the honey is substantially less viscous at midday temperatures than it was in the morning. And your flow rate has changed despite the fact that you or any of the lazy drones you're in charge of haven't touched the adjustable flow control valve thumb wheel. You know this because you check the colored scale on the knob and it's exactly where you left it. Wouldn't it be great to make a flow control valve needle out of something that expands when it's heated and closes off more of the orifice and contracts when it's cooled to open up the orifice. Well, check it out. They do. It's called metal. Actually, it's a lot more complicated than that, but that's ultimately what it does. Expand when it's heated, contract when it's cooled. The specially shaped metal stem does so in a predictable manner, such that the flow rate remains the same regardless of temperature conditions. Why you would ever have this feature in something that is also not pressure compensated is a mystery, so pretty much all temperature compensated valves are also pressure compensated valves, ultimately providing constant flow rate regardless of input or output pressure conditions or temperatures of the fluid. An application for this type of flow control valve is in an industrial process with varying loads in a harsh environment. An example would be a hydraulically driven conveyor belt at a lumberyard where truckloads of logs of different masses are dropped on it at varying times of the day and in varying environmental conditions. You know, because some days are cold and some days are hot and not every tree is the same. The hydraulic motor driving this conveyor belt will experience less load for a pecker pole than that of a thousand year old old growth dug fir covered with spotted owls. Ideally, you'd like them both turned into toilet paper at the same rate, whether they're dumped on the conveyor on a hot summer day or a cold winter morning. This is where the pressure compensated and temperature compensated flow control valve steps in. Regardless of input conditions, within reason, flow should remain constant. Here are some images providing some experimental verification of the behavior of a non-pressure compensated flow control valve driving a continually rotating, lightly loaded hydraulic motor. Our initial state has an input pressure of 300 psi and a load-induced output pressure of 100 psi. In this case, the flow meter is indicating a flow rate of approximately 0.4 gallons per minute or approximately 1.5 liters per minute. If one was to reduce the input pressure to 200 psi and keep the load-induced output pressure constant at 100 psi, the differential between them would decrease and flow rate falls.
If one was to return input pressure to 300 psi and keep the load induced output pressure constant at 100 psi, flow rate returns to our initial value. If one was to increase input pressure to 500 psi and keep the load induced output pressure constant at 100 psi, the differential between them would increase and flow rate increases. If one was to return input pressure to 300 psi and keep the load induced output pressure constant at 100 psi, flow rate returns to our initial value. If one kept input pressure at 300 psi and the load induced output pressure increased to 200 psi, the differential between them would decrease and flow rate decreases. Finally, if we return to our initial state of 300 psi input and 100 psi load induced output pressure, flow rate returns to our initial value of 0.4 gallons per minute or approximately 1.5 liters per minute. This illustrates both the usefulness of a non-pressure compensated flow control valve for predictable input conditions and the limitations of this same valve when exposed to varying conditions. Now let's examine the functionality of a pressure compensated flow control valve in the exact same scenario. Our initial state has an input pressure of 300 psi and a load induced output pressure of 100 psi. In this case, the flow meter is indicating a flow rate of approximately 0.4 gallons per minute or approximately 1.5 liters per minute. If one was to reduce input pressure to 200 psi and keep the load induced output pressure constant at 100 psi, the pressure compensated flow control valve keeps flow rate the same at approximately 0.4 gallons per minute or 1.5 liters per minute, despite the fact that the pressure differential is less. If one was to increase input pressure to 500 psi and keep the load induced output pressure constant at 100 psi, the pressure compensated flow control valve keeps flow rate the same at approximately 0.4 gallons per minute or 1.5 liters per minute, despite the fact that the pressure differential is more. If one kept input pressure at 300 psi and the load induced output pressure increased to 200 psi, the pressure compensated flow control valve keeps the flow rate the same at approximately 0.4 gallons per minute or 1.5 liters per minute, despite the fact that the pressure differential is less. Finally, if we return to our initial state of 300 psi input and 100 psi load induced output, flow rate returns to our initial value. This illustrates the usefulness of a pressure compensated flow control valve for varying input and output conditions. Again, realize pressure compensated flow control valves are not magic and they have ranges inside which they are intended to operate and outside of which they won't keep flow nearly as stable. If we were to perform this same experiment with a temperature and pressure compensated flow control valve, we would expect to observe the same flow rate for a range of input and output pressures and a range of temperatures. In addition to a pressure compensated flow control valve, Maintaining a constant flow rate to a single actuator driving varying loads it can be used to maintain the flow rate of a multi-actuator system. Ordinarily, the activation or deactivation of another component within a hydraulic system causes the sudden drop or spike in pressure or flow and may inadvertently affect a non-pressure compensated flow control valve. This is a simulated hydraulically driven drill circuit where the pressure compensated flow control valve keeps the rotational speed of the drill constant, i.e. the flow rate to our hydraulic motor constant, despite the spikes and drops in pressure when the cylinder is extended or retracted. Notice the flow rate remains constant at approximately 0.53 gallons per minute or two liters per minute, and the speed of the hydraulic motor remains constant despite the pressure pulses when the cylinder is extended or retracted. Realize restriction type pressure compensated flow control valves are not the only type of pressure compensated flow control valve on the beach. There exists something called a bypass type pressure compensated flow control valve. The restriction type flow control valve's main disadvantage is the return of the excess backed up flow at high pressure via the main pressure relief valve. The bypass type pressure compensated flow control valve overcomes this disadvantage by using a compensator spool and bias spring combination that covers and uncovers a drain passageway to the tank. This way, excess fluid is returned to the tank at a lower pressure and the main pressure relief valve is not activated. These types of valves require a port to tank in addition to the regular in and out ports. Speaking of additional lines, 
Realize the flow rate through the flow control valve can be adjusted by other means than a manual thumb wheel. For example, an infinitely variable, i.e. analog, electrically positioned needle. Additionally, there exist pilot-operated flow control valves when the screw-in needle is replaced with a tapered spool that is moved into or out of the passageway based upon a pilot signal. You can have a single pilot where the spool is naturally held in a full open or fully closed position and the single pilot signal X regulates it from there. Or you can have a double pilot where the imbalance between the X and Y signal regulates flow up or down. Final note about pressure compensated flow control valves. Realize if this valve is run in reverse, especially one without a check valve bypass, the compensator spool will be fully displaced to one end of its passage. When the valve is returned to flow in the meter direction, the compensator spool has to readjust before it can properly meter flow. The point is, there is a brief moment in time when the actuator can lunge or jump prior to it being properly controlled. To account for this, some pressure compensated flow control valves have an adjustable lunge control. All this is is another needle that keeps the compensator spool where it's supposed to be kind of like using a $200 textbook as a doorstop. The compensator spool is not necessary in reverse operation, so this lunge control adjustment needle just keeps the compensator spool from drifting past a certain point. This way it's in an ideal position and ready to control flow when direction reverses. Finally, finally, you'll see flow control valves in the oddest of places. They're not always external separate entities. For example, you will find flow control valves internal to a cylinder acting as cushions on extension and retraction. You might even find flow control valves internal to a directional control valve, where one position of a directional control valve happens to meter flow. Additionally, you'll find flow control valve functionality inside something called a proportional valve, something we'll go over much later, where flow is proportionally dependent upon spool position. We'll deal with all these subjects in later lectures. But realize your understanding of this totally awesome later material is predicated upon your understanding of the supporting material now. In conclusion, this lecture presented different configurations of the flow control valve and its purpose and function within a hydraulic system. We examined non-pressure compensated flow control valves, pressure compensated flow control valves, pressure and temperature compensated flow control valves, and discussed their internal construction, function, and schematic symbols. We learned that the orientation of a check valve is a key feature in determining the direction of free unrestricted flow in metered or controlled flow. Remember to review these concepts as often as you need to really drive it home. Imagine how well lab will go if you know what you're doing. Thank you very much for your attention and interest, and we'll see you again during the next lecture of our series. Remember to tell your lazy lab partner about this resource, and be sure to check out the Big Bad Tech channel for additional resources and updates.